I felt totally renewed after the transplant. Like day and night, Ab like absolute day and night. Like the things that I can do now are, are like joyful. I can hardly believe it really. It's so much better um, in terms of energy and freedom. I think the experience has made me aware of so many more things in life, things that I always took for granted, especially the people in my life. And um, the transplant experience has made that happen. For patients and their families, the whole transplantation experience can be overwhelming. There's a lot of information to take in, there's a lot of decisions to be made, but the most important thing patients and their families need to remember is that the whole transplant team is here to support them. Following transplantation, patients are at risk of developing additional health complications. These complications will vary from patient to patient and are not only related to the immunosuppressive medication you are prescribed, but also to your risk factor profile. The purpose of this video is to help you understand which risk factors are changeable, which ones are not, and also what health complications to look for and what they might mean to you. The most important complications are osteoporosis, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Let's look first at osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a disease where there is a decrease in the bone density or a loss of bone mass. Over time, this makes the bones brittle and susceptible to fracture. It's also very more common with females related to hormonal changes. Also, the medications that we give after transplant can cause osteoporosis. So it's a side effect of the drugs that we give. We are still learning a lot about osteoporosis in the transplant patient, and we know that the greatest risk is in the first six months when the steroids are highest, and it may well be that therapy will not be necessary long term, so that if we can treat during the high risk period, we can prevent the problem. The outlook for osteoporosis can be good. It's something that we need to treat early, and we are trying to treat it in a preventative fashion right now, monitoring our patients pre-transplant in some cases, as well as post-transplant and continuing along the way. We know that one in four women over the age of 50 have osteoporosis, and we know that one in eight men over the age of 50 have osteoporosis. There are clear-cut risk factors for it, and apart from the risk factors that you can't change, like being a woman, having a history of osteoporosis in the family, and getting a bit older, there are other risk factors that play a role, such as inactivity, which is important when we think of the transplant patient, uh, diet, excess alcohol, a history of smoking, calcium intake, and drugs. And this is really where the big role comes in in the transplant patient. We clearly know that steroids or prednisone plays a role in the development of osteoporosis. The treatment for osteoporosis can be a simple treatment in some cases in, in just a uh, minor decrease in bone density. Exercise is very important. Walking is, is great. In the non-transplant patient, it's clearly been shown that physical activity, weight-bearing activity, allowing the muscles to pull on the bones will help to promote the bone mass staying steady. Secondary is actually looking at diet, and we know that calcium is one of the most important things to maintain bone mass in terms of your diet. Generally, it's best done through increasing the natural calcium in the diet, and calcium is found in foods such as milk and cheese and, and other, other foods. But oftentimes, it's difficult to get the amount you need straight from foods, and another way to go is through a calcium supplement. The third area that we can get into then is actual drug treatment, and there's a variety of different drugs, and, and clearly before any are started, you need to have a lengthy discussion uh, with the transplant team that is looking after you, because certain drugs are going to be better for certain populations who have osteoporosis. I was diagnosed with osteoporosis just under a year ago, it's in my spine, it's where it is, and um, that hasn't made a big difference or a big impact in my life either. I've just kept on with most of what I've done. There have been a few changes. Um, they have me on a drug that builds bone density, and um, a little bit, I'm a little bit more cautious of my diet. I always drank milk and had lots of calcium products, um, but I'm, I'm especially careful now to make sure that I get them. 
And the other thing is that I make sure that I get weight-bearing exercise at least a couple of times a week. You want to remain active, you've just undergone a transplant, and you want to now get back to life as best you can. One of the most important post-operative complications is an increased risk of cancer. It comes because of the use of immune suppress suppressive agents. So the, the job of the immune system, if you like, is to recognize parts of the body that ought not to be there and then to attack them. That obviously is important in terms of transplanted organs. So we have to suppress the immune system's ability to do that. Unfortunately, that also interferes with the immune system's job in other respects, infections, recognizing that, and also recognizing abnormal cells and controlling their, their growth, which is part of what the immune system also does. Consequently, on immune suppressive agents, there are certain cancers which are just more frequent. There are four cancers that transplant patients need to be most aware of. Skin cancer, cervical cancer, lymphoma, and colon cancer. The most common of these is skin cancer. And although it doesn't develop right away, uh, it can develop in patients uh, many years post-transplant. There are specific signs and symptoms that will help us to detect a cancer. In terms of skin conditions, any change in a mole or development of a new mole should be looked at carefully. You should always watch your skin, look at your arms, your hands, your face and ears, and watch for any developing new spots which don't look normal to you. If you notice any abnormal spots or lesions on your skin that are new or are worrying you, then it's important to immediately contact your transplant team, either your physician or your transplant coordinator. These are very treatable kinds of cancers. If they're detected early, they need not cause a huge problem. It's important also for patients to be aware that these conditions are associated with sunlight exposure and to take precautions when they're out in the sun, either wearing a hat or using sunblock. So early detection and prevention are the best ways to manage that. A second kind of cancer that's more common in our patients is cancer of the cervix. So naturally it's only the female patients that need to be concerned about this. It's important that um, women on, on immunosuppressive agents have regular gynecologic examinations, in, including a pap smear. There's another kind of cancer which is more common in transplant patients as well, and that's a cancer called lymphoma. And that one is much more likely to happen earlier in the course of the transplant. And we believe that it's related to the amount of medication that we have to use uh, to suppress rejection. With the lymphomas, those are often seen as changes in lymph nodes and the swelling of a lymph node. So these sort of, of uh, things when they, when they become present should be discussed with a transplant coordinator or with physicians at their visits. It's a more serious kind of cancer but can be treated by chemotherapy in the way that any other patient would have it uh, assessed. Colon cancers are, are more difficult but changes in bowel habit or the presence of blood in a bowel movement would have to be taken seriously. Tumors in a patient on immunosuppressive agents, even if they're not of this group, but just occur um, as might happen in the rest of the population, are harder to treat. And one of the problems is that with immune suppression, they tend to grow more rapidly. Secondly, the use of chemotherapeutic agents, which is are the standard therapy for many types of uh, cancers and, and other tumors is more difficult. The presence of immune suppression already uh, can put patients at risk with chemotherapy for a marked change in their bone marrow and open them up to more problems with infection. I think that the patient has a major role, obviously, to play in the management of, of uh, of tumors, primarily in the cancers by early detection, by noticing and bringing to the attention of, of the transplant team those changes in the skin or uh, possible changes in, in bowel habits that can then create a situation in which investigations take place. 
Although transplant patients may be more at risk for certain cancers, they are just as susceptible to other cancers as the rest of the population. Part of a healthy lifestyle should include a regular prostate exam for men and regular breast self-examination and mammograms for women. About uh, two years ago, uh, during one of my assessments, I had a bronchoscopy and, and uh, one of the biopsies they had taken from my lungs showed some abnormalities in the cell tissues and it turned out that it was a lymphoperiphery disorder, which is a type of lymphoma that can occur after transplantation. They think it's uh, due to being immunosuppressed in combination with the Epstein-Barr virus. And that was uh, a tough one to hear. Uh, you hear lymphoma, you think cancer and all that goes in with that. Um, however, uh, you know, that was two years ago. Uh, and I'm still here and still feeling fantastic. But uh, it definitely is something that has been difficult to deal with at times. Diabetes is a serious complication that all transplant patients need to be aware of. It will affect patients who already have it and those that do not. The risk of diabetes varies from patient to patient depending on certain risk factors that include family history, age, and weight. Patients who have been living with diabetes before the transplant will probably need to adjust their insulin and diet. The signs and symptoms of diabetes include increased urination, increased thirst, weight loss, and blurred vision. Diabetes is a medical condition that um, results from uh, the pancreas not able to produce enough insulin or the insulin in fact is not being used properly. Diabetes has its own set of complications. This includes higher risk of uh, heart attack and stroke, visual disturbances and also problems with the circulation to the small blood vessels and the fingers and the toes. Our patient population has an increased risk of diabetes related to the drugs that they're on to protect their transplanted organ. In the early transplant period when patients are on high doses of these medications, this is when we may first see the onset of diabetes. These patients are coming for frequent blood tests and abnormal blood sugar levels are picked up very quickly. If our patient population has an history of diabetes pre-transplant, then we watch them closely post-transplant again, but we also work with them to adjust their insulins accordingly. If a patient is a new onset diabetic, uh, we would try and control their blood sugar initially with diet or pills. If we had difficulty controlling the blood sugars, they might require insulin injections. Patients who are diabetic before the transplant, if they've been on pills and diet control before the transplant, they could probably anticipate being on insulin injections after the transplant to maintain good blood sugar control. But knowing those factors, we can try and reduce their risk by controlling their blood sugars well. And uh, good diet and exercise is important for controlling their weight. The duration of the treatment may be depending on how well the person responds to the medication. And certainly when the steroids are reduced, there may be an improvement in blood sugar. So it's very individualized for each patient. With uh, good blood sugar control and a proper diet, in consultation with the entire transplant team, we hope to be able to give these patients a better quality of life and limit the complications of the diabetes. My diabetes was something that I had to deal with before transplant. It wasn't caused because of transplant. And I find now, after sort of settling into a routine, I'm actually on less insulin now than I was before. I've been on and off insulin um, since the uh, transplant. Basically, it depends on how high my uh, dose is for steroids, and as, as that's lowered, so is my insulin requirement. Remember to look for the signs and symptoms of diabetes. They include increased urination, increased thirst, weight loss, and blurred vision. Your transplant team has information available to help you manage this condition. High blood pressure is also common for many transplant patients. These patients will need to be monitored and may require medication. It occurs in transplant patients for different reasons depending on uh, which of their organs has failed and which organ they received a transplant of. It's common for patients with kidney disease to have high blood pressure even before they get transplants. It's common for all groups of patients to have it after transplantation 
primarily because of medications. Most patients get no symptoms whatsoever of high blood pressure. Occasional patients may have uh, symptoms uh, such as headaches or feeling unwell. Patients who have a tendency to high blood pressure pre-transplant will most likely require something in the post-transplant period. The type of medication that the patients are treated with varies from patient to patient. The effectiveness of the medication in each individual patient is based on the side effects the patient has and how effective the blood pressure pill is at controlling their blood pressure. We have a variety uh, of things that we can do to treat. We start uh, with diet in the sense of optimizing weight, of avoiding extra salt, generally avoiding the salt shaker. Exercise may also be helpful, avoiding things like smoking and alcohol. It's very important for the patients to let us know immediately to monitor their blood pressure at home if they have the equipment, to write down those blood pressure readings and bring them with them when they come to see their physician in clinic, and to let us know if there's any side effects they're having, headaches for example, and letting us know as early as possible. If you do have a problem either with the changes in your lifestyle we've suggested or with side effects from the medication, it's critical that you communicate those to your doctor or nurse so that we can address the problems with you and to find a regimen that works for you and your blood pressure. In combination with good diet and exercise and the medications that are available, blood pressure can be treated very effectively. Cholesterol is the measurement of fatty substances in the blood that can increase your risk for heart disease and stroke. Risk factors associated with high cholesterol include family history, diet, weight, age, inactivity, and medication. Some of the research that we've done in the transplant population, we found that about 40 to 60 percent of our patients will develop high cholesterol after the transplant. Some of our patients who are on the immunosuppressive medications may have high cholesterol because of these medications. Cholesterols are regularly monitored in clinic by a simple blood test. What we recommend certainly is diet control, limiting the fat in the diet, and exercise. Once you have been identified with high cholesterol, we ask that you uh, meet with a dietitian and go over the nutrition care plan for high cholesterol. We're going to be looking at good, healthy eating. We're going to be looking at uh, keeping your weight within the ideal range. We're going to be designing a nutrition care plan that's individualized and tailored to your needs. There are available many drugs today that lower cholesterol, and about uh, half of the patients, transplant patients, um, are put on these cholesterol-lowering agents. Certainly, people should be aware of the cholesterol level, and they should be aware of the ways to control the cholesterol to decrease their risk for cardiac disease. The health complications you face as a transplant patient can be managed when the signs and symptoms are recognized early. And although not all transplant patients develop these signs and symptoms, it is important that you are aware of them and learn to recognize them. Remember that your transplant team has the information you need to know to help you understand what these complications mean to you. No matter what the patient's circumstances are, no matter where they are in their learning process or in their transplantation experience, the transplant team is here to help them every step of the way. You can't even describe it, the feeling that you have inside it. I just knew that something was given to me inside and that it was going to give me a whole new chance to be able to do, like even walk down the road and do some things that I still want to do. Life is as good as it always has been, as it was without the osteoporosis. But uh, you realize that the road after a transplant is not necessarily all smooth. There are potholes, there are mountains that you have to move around every once in a while. But you move around them and you go on. I've been given a second chance. People say, what are your, what are your limits? I don't know. I haven't found them.